We are strong. We are proud. We are the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. We build vibrant communities across the state by investing in our people. By the year 2042, one of three Coloradans will be of Latino ancestry. We must create opportunity so our children, families, and elders can share their stories, feel connected, and give back at all levels of society to shape an inclusive Colorado. We are your trusted partner, your ambassador for transformative change. Somos familia. Let's create our collective power together. Connect with us at latinocfc.org. Celebrate with us on October 13, 2022, as we celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado at the Denver Art Museum. Don't miss it. This is the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado, our story series. This series elevates and addresses issues pertinent throughout Latino communities in Colorado and beyond. We believe transformative change is possible when the collective power of the Latino community comes together. Hello, I'm Carlos Martinez with the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. The Foundation welcomes you to the Our Story Collective Power podcast. This episode, Quienes Somos, part two, continues the exploration of Latino identity and the term Latinx, as well as explores the explosive growth of Latinos and the community's complexity around identity with Dr. Cristina Mora, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Colorado, Berkeley. My name is Rachel Griego, and I'm the Vice President of Philanthropy for the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. It's my pleasure to be here with you today for part two of our story forum series, Quienes Somos, Our Collective Identity, with Dr. Cristina Mora. So Dr. Mora, let's continue the discussion. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit more about how these, um, these systems continue to try to box us in and, and try to make us seem as if we're, we're one when we're so diverse in our community. Yeah, so you know, thinking about the the census and you know the importance of data, one important thing to consider is, you know, Rachel, you filled out the form and, and you have <laughs> some some history filling out the forms. The number one question I get from sort of community members, my own family members that fill out the form is like, why do they ask me two times who I am? Like, why do they ask me if I'm Latino? And then why do they ask me this race question? And where's Latino? Why is Latino not a, an option here? And it's so confusing. And it has been that way by design since the 1970s. In fact, back in when the Bureau was thinking about this category, they thought, okay, are we gonna say, are you black? Are you white? Are you Latino? Are you Asian? At that time, they did Hispanic slash Spanish origin. Right. And they actually, you know, demurred. They said, no, 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 we can't do that. We can't do that for two main reasons. One was that they feared that if they made Latino sort of a category and made it mutually exclusive with white or black, they feared that this would mess up a history of a white black question that they had used for decades. And in fact, statisticians told activists who pushed back and said, well, we're not white and we're not black. And if you're not putting us as a category, you're assuming you're forcing us to choose white or black. And the Bureau was like, oh, it's, we've had these white black distinctions for centuries. And so we can't necessarily mess with them. And you know, this is an experimental question. And they once again had no idea about the explosive growth of Latinos and how this would become one of the most important questions that the Bureau asked. So the Dr. second thing, Dr. Mona, uh -huh. real, real quickly, I want to, I'm, I'm really curious. What do you think of the term Latinx? Oh, I mean, so we've now been studying it for a while now. It's been in vogue since about 2010. 
And what we really see is that it is a youthful expression of Latino identity, right? Mm -hmm. And what we see, for example, in California, we ran a survey and we asked folks, do you consider yourself Latinx? Generation Z, which is basically 1995, if you were born in 1995 or above, mm -hmm. fully one quarter of them, 25% use Latinx in some places to describe themselves. And I think when we're thinking about these different labels, and I absolutely know some people totally hate Latinx. Yes. Some people like Latinx. It's very controversial. <laughs> I understand how controversial it is. Um, I also know this. We are complex people. We have the ability to express and describe ourselves in different ways, in different settings. And what we found around those sort of youth that use Latinx is they'll use Latinx. They also use Latino. They also often use Hispanic. They also often use other terms to describe themselves. And that's not crazy. <laughs> that's normal. That's normal. You know, Latinos have had so many terms to describe themselves from raza to brown to Spanish surname to Chicano to sometimes I want to say I'm Mexican to sometimes I want to say, you know, I'm Latina. And we've never gone crazy. Right. The group has never dissolved into nothingness. <laughs> We're still here. The way I think about it is these ideas about Latinx are, are attached to a real politics, right? and are attached to real points of views that people in our community have. Right. Let's use these moments as opportunities for real discussions. Latinx opened a real discussion about sexuality, homophobia, gender binaries within the Latino community. It forced open that discussion. If we're gonna keep evolving, if we're gonna be continue to try to understand who we are in our great diversity, we need to make room for these conversations, just as we're making room much more for indigenous Latino identity exactly. and for Afro Latinx identities. We need to make these rooms and they're not the easiest conversations to have no, because they're, they're amidst <laughs> sort of they're amidst about diversity, right? And I think right. sometimes sometimes we fall into a fear that if we talk about them, then we're not real. Then we're saying Latinidad is nothing, right? Because it's everything. And I don't think so. Our, we've been here for a long time. Our aggregate patterns are real. You know, Latinos, no matter if you say Latinx or Latino or Hispanic, we're still a community that is likely to have lower levels of higher education, right. much significantly much more higher levels of what we call working poverty. Just think, we are the population that is most likely to work so hard and still be poor, mm -hmm. right? We're going to have these sort of significant trends vis-a-vis -vis police brutality in our neighborhoods. We're really likely to be segregated. All of these, all of these factors come into play, right? We have the least political representation than any other group in this country. All of these statistics continue, no matter if I call myself Latino, Mexican, you know, they continue right. and these become real problems. So because this is still a social justice issue in my mind, right? They necessitate a continuous understanding of who we are, not at a surface level, not just at a level of like, who am I? Like, what kind of music do I like? What kind of food do Latinos eat? All of that is fine and it's okay. We can talk about Latino culture, but we also must not divorce it from the real questions of the Latino condition and the real issue of social justice often. Sometimes I think it's almost like some, it's perpetuated like that. It, it, they create this divisiveness amongst us and we have all of these different labels and we're still trying to figure out who we are. You know, we, we've done listening tours throughout the state of Colorado and, you know, our, our aim is to try to get people engaged and have them, you know, think about civics and, and how, you know, important it is for them so that, you know, for the, you know, their contributions and to get away from that scarcity mentality and, and to, to focus more on the abundance and all our contributions. And we run into people that we start talking about this identity and all of a sudden they're just like, how do you expect me to be civically engaged when I don't even know who I am? And that question yeah. is so profound and, and so confusing depending on which age group you're in. If I was to have a conversation with my, with my grandmother, uh, my abuelita, and tell her, you know, grandma, I'm Latinx, she would be like, you know, I, she would probably be offended because she would want me to say I'm Mexican first. But, you know, we're so diverse in terms of our intersectionalities, too. I mean, 
We identify in different things. I'm a daughter. I'm a mother. You know, I'm Latina. I'm, you know, a philanthropist. I mean, there's just so much to this. And as you were talking about this, this leads me into wanting to talk a little bit more about how do we balance this diversity, our commonalities and our difference among Latinos, country of origin, language, immigration status, our culture and traditions, colorism that plays into our community as well. It, you know, we are complex. And I don't know if we're ever going to have a conclusion to this discussion, but I think that you had mentioned to me about how we start, have to start being more strategic about this and how we have to start looking at each other as our community, you know, instead of just sort of this individualistic type of way. Yeah, I, I think about this in two ways. So as an educator, I think about the incredible importance of knowing your history. Right. How do you know who you are? How do you know who you are? You are living in a country that forever has ignored Latino history, that forever has not borne witness to the amazing contributions that your people, this community has given to the nation, right? That has denied them, that has denigrated their language, that has perpetually marked them as foreigners, no matter if they were Puerto Rican or if they were Central American, right? The first thing we've got to do is learn our history. That's where you learn pride. And so I've always been a huge backer of ethnic studies courses, for example, even in high school. Integrate the curriculum, create these children books that tell us about Silvia Mendes and the fight to integrate uh, Mexican-American students in broader schools that was really sort of an impetus for Brown versus Board of, the edu Board of Education. Start talking about sort of the history of the Chicano movement, the history of the Boricua, like give your younger generations a sense of being grounded, a sense of purpose and that they belong, that they are not these outsiders that have come in and should be sort of seen as foreigners and grateful for what's given to them, but that they right. have been part and parcel of this country, even if they were not born here, right? Because part of our history is also deeply understanding that relationship between the United States and Latin America, right? And why it's not just a coincidence that Latinos are here, right? Exactly. It's structurally <laughs> incorporated, right? And so I think the first part of like who we are is, you know, supporting an effort to educate ourselves about our history. So that's the first part. And I think the second part is once we are educated about our history, we're going to understand that this is a real racial and social justice question, right? That we've been here for so long and we've still been treated this way. We've been right. here for so long and we still don't have the level of higher education that other groups, you know, there are so few studies right now about Latino wealth. Yes. We know that there's a huge black white gap, uh, gap in America but we know little to nothing about the Latino white wealth gap. We know little about how Latinos have been systematically redlined, how they were victims of the mortgage crisis. We know so little about this. And so we need to engage in these stories, live these stories, and then use those stories as fuel for what are we going to do now, right? And they've Absolutely. got to be personal, individual fuel, and they've got to be community level fuel because the, you know, you can talk about strategy all you want. If people don't feel connected to each other, they're just not going to feel connected. And so you need to find a way in which our stories are connected. And, you know, Latino studies and the field of Latino history has been around now for a good about sort of four decades. And it's sort of supporting these and supporting also, you know, Latina children books authors right. that tell us our stories that we've been here from different points of view. I think the second part is then also recognizing Latino contributions. And yeah. if we just look at a contemporary contribution, I, I wish the media would report. And, you know, Latinos aren't in higher education, which means we're not journalists, which means we're not writing the media the stories, table. which we're not at these tables. Right. But if you just look at 2020, it was interesting to me how the media automatically zoomed into what was going on with, you know, a new level of Latino Trump support, but not enough, not enough attention was given to the miracle that was Arizona, <laughs> to the miracle that was Latino community yeah. families, Latinas, uh, Latino youth organizing, registering folks to vote in yeah. quinceañeras outside of Mexican supermarkets, outside of churches, getting them and turning 
what had been one of been the most hostile places to live as a Latino 10 years ago into a blue state. I mean, that was remarkable. And that was about sort of the grit of these communities coming together and seeing power in sort of the neighbor to neighbor connection and power in if your abuelita can't vote, maybe she could man the table, maybe she could yeah. help, you know, in, in some of these small organizing things. And I think, you know, that's where a lot of our power lies, oh, but it strength. needs to be connected. Absolutely. Our strength. I mean, I, I am so proud to be a Latina and to be living here in Colorado with this amazing Hispanic community. I mean, talk about pivoting when, when they needed to talk about still serving um, the community, serving as the as a safety net, you know, and continuing to work, continuing to put themselves in harm, continuing to get the vote out, continuing to get the census count, despite all of these challenges. I mean, you know, I, I, I sometimes shy away from the term resilience because I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, yes, we're strong. You know, I, you know everyone knows that. But but you're right. I mean, we are not takers. We are givers. We are contributors. And I feel like more so than ever, COVID has sort of, you know, taken the veil off and really shown that systemic, systemic racism does exist, that we aren't where we should be because of these things, but that our community continues to come through. When we're asked, we, we do it. We make it happen. And so I completely 100% agree with you. Yeah. I don't think that we get that narrative off, you know, told oftentimes. So we need to start working on doing better in terms of making sure that we're in control of our story. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And which means, like you said, Rachel, we need to get to the table. Yes. And if higher education is not accepting us, if our schools are not sort of up to par, how are we doing this? What are we doing to push this forward, right? This is not just about, you know, are we creating wealth or are we creating social mobility? This is a real racial justice imperative, Absolutely. right? Go to college because your grandmother was denied access to college. As you sit in these places, know the long line of Latinas and Latinos who were never allowed to enter these places. And I wish our students, I wish our community, I wish that, you know, our youth sort of could grow up with this. And little by little, you see spaces yeah. in which this is happening. You see, for example, in California, the fastest growing segment of teachers are Latinas, right? And, you know, they could have any other job they want. They could make money as real estate agents or whatever. But mm -hmm. part of them is their imperative to really go back and give back to the community in these ways. No, absolutely. And that's important. Absolutely. So I guess the, the you know, the the question is, with Latino identity evolving and, you know, obviously con constantly in flux and changing. And as you mentioned, who would have thought, right, back in the 1960s, we'd be where we're at now. So let's finish this discussion with you looking at your crystal ball and figuring, you know, and looking deeply into it. And what kind of changes do you expect in the next year? What do you see in this next decade? Um, you know, I always like to leave with optimism and hope. And, you know, when we finish this discussion, we're going to have a, you know, we're going to have a discussion with participants and, you know, continue to delve a little bit deeper. But I'm really curious about what do you think, what do you, what are you, what are you seeing in the next 10 years? Yeah, I'm hopeful as well. This is what I see. You know, I see that we're going to continue to be bigger and more diverse than ever. Yeah. You know, with every decade, we say, oh, my God, we're more diverse. There's more people from this country or that country. It's go It's going to go beyond that. We're going to become more politically diverse. We're going to be more class diverse. As, for example, my parents never went to college, but now I have kids, right? They're growing up with a totally different conditions, and they might not become professors. They might become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. They're going to have a different class standing, Right. right. And so as we come, become bigger, we're going to become much more diverse. And remember, the youth have all kinds of different ideas now about gender, but about race politics as well, about climate. They're pushing us in all these ways. And so what's going to be really important is that if our organizations like the Latino Community Foundation, like some of these big national organizations, do not shy away from that. And you have to do it in a new way. You can't do it the same way. Back in the day, we used to say, we're diverse. Look, we're Puerto Rican, we're Mexican. We're... Yeah. That, that's the old way of paying homage to diversity. The new way is these uncomfortable conversations, right? Yeah. In which we put to the table, you know, things that sort of expose ideas like colorism and anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity and, 
homophobia that put it because it's only by us really tackling this and tackling it in an honest way and in an honest way that then attaches it to our history and who we are as an imperfect people but that is striving towards sort of a vision of justice that we can put that into the fore my fear is always this my fear is that as we become more diverse the talk about latinos becomes much more focused on our taste are like lofty ideas of latinas like to wear bright colors and speak <laughs> spanish or earrings yes. or, or things like uh -huh. that that when someone will say what makes a latino a latino that someone would say they eat spicy food that is my fear what i want us to say is that they are a people striving for justice there are people that push back against the sense that folks south of the us mexican border are foreigners there are people that demand a critical understanding in this country about who belongs that there are people tied in a deep understanding about the way systemic racism has kept them down and that divides them yep. you know we know we've been talking a little bit about the last election we know that um you know support for undocumented immigrants isn't 100% amongst the community right. right and so having these conversations where we bring sort of history to the fore will only make us stronger i think too often we shy from diversity no and more, we just no sort of want to paper no it over no. away right thank you no. thank you so the, much the for those words important. we need to hear them we need to hear them more often <laughs> we definitely need to hear yeah. them more often um, no, I agree with you and thank you so much. I'm so happy that you're at the table uh, and that more Latina PhDs are, are going to be joining you and, and are already, you know, already there. And I hope that, um, you know, with Fuerza, we'll, we'll continue to, to build our strength and our power. We have the numbers. We continue to grow. So thank you so much. Thank you for creating this space. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. Thank you for joining us today for the Our Story podcast, where Latino lived experiences meets action. Mil gracias to Dr. Christina Mora. This series was made possible through the support of the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, the Colorado Health Foundation, Molson Coors, and the University of Colorado. Production credits to Emmy-winning producers Truce Media Collective. To learn more about the work of the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado, visit us at latinocfc.org. If you liked what you heard today, consider supporting the Our Story podcast through a donation so that we may continue producing Latino-focused, Latino-informed programming that advances our narrative. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Latino. CFC. This is the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado, our story series. Next up, episode 5, part 1, Nuestras Historias. Leading through our live experiences, features two bold and courageous Colorado leaders, Alex Sanchez, Executive Director of Voces Unidas de las Montañas, and entrepreneur Rocio Duran, founder of Rocio Life Coach. Follow their unique live experiences as they help us to reflect and value our early teachings, cuentos, history, culture, and traditions, and how they play a role in influencing our leadership style, shape our sense of identity, and help us to navigate the world.